Hi, I'm Angie Veeman, and welcome to Totally Clutch. This is the podcast for women like you to find ways to simplify your business and personal life. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe so you're notified when a new episode is posted. Welcome back to another episode of Totally Clutch, the Clutch Businesses podcast and vlog. And we've got another episode, another, uh, I guess, new style of episode today where we're going behind the scenes and looking at an existing uh, an existing successful thriving business and just looking at some of the the challenges that they're facing and talking through some real solutions for how to work through those challenges. So today we have um, we have the honor of of having uh, the team from Maestro Tales. So Maestro Tales is they go into classrooms, they go into, you know, they work with children and really work to inspire them to fall in love with classical music and with storytelling. And they ultimately have the goal of making these increasingly diminishing art forms um, more accessible to kids from every background and from all over the world. And what they're dealing with so early on, you know, obviously this is a very in-person type of business. It's really reliant on being live in person with with these children. And so early on in the pandemic, they pivoted and went online, and uh, and it and it looked different. It felt different. It didn't um, it didn't hit in the same way that they did when they were in the classrooms. And they put a lot behind it. They put a lot of energy. They put a lot of time. They put a lot of money into building that out. And so what we're going to talk about today is how do how do both of those things exist at the same time and or, or do they? So can they can they maintain this kind of online not in person component along with the in person component or and or how do they maximize both of those? So how do they make sure that they're marketing in the right way? How do they make sure that they're delivering their product and services in in the way that feels uh, best for them and produces the best results for the people, for the students in the class. So with that, I want to welcome Maestro Tales. So mm-hmm. Emily and Jenny, um, and we are missing one, uh, Brian, but um, yeah, so thank you so much for being here today. I'm super excited to, to talk through this with you. Thank you for having us. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Absolutely. So do you want to tell us, I mean, I gave, you know, a basic and maybe not so exciting um, idea of of what Maestro Tales is. Do you want to tell us a bit about what you do and kind of how you came to do that? Sure. Jenny, do you want to go ahead or shall I? Or shall we just... I'll I'll give a start and then Emily, you can jump in. How about that? Uh, So... um, We, Emily and Brian and I all have a musical background and have since the time we were kids. And when we became parents not too long ago, uh, we thought that it would be a really good thing for us to be able to introduce them to classical music the way we were introduced to it when we were kids. And we started... Uh, putting together this idea of expanding that and bringing it to kids uh, near near us and other kids that our kids went to school with. And this idea of creating a class was born. And I still remember Emily and I sitting on her roof in Astoria, New York, and writing the theme song <laughs> to our class with her guitar. Um, and then it was probably about three years later that it really started to... Uh, to take off when we really actually put it together. So what it is, is it takes elements of storytelling and classical music and introducing uh, symphonic and cultural instruments from around the world to students and allowing them to hear them, see them, touch them up close and, um, providing them with what we hope is a an appreciation for this art form that I hope doesn't die. That's awesome. And well, I mean, and yeah, so needed and, and so it sounds so fun. It sounds so fun. Um, So why don't, can you tell us a bit about what your business looked like pre pandemic and 
give us an idea of what it looked like maybe in the midst of the pandemic and then kind of what it looks like now? Sure, I'll take that one. Um, we started our business um, January of 2019. And we pretty quickly were able to set up several, um, I think three classes a week at the beginning of in-person uh, classes in our local area, which we are now um, in New Jersey. And the classes were selling well. And we were able to make that work with our schedule. Um, and we, they were received really, 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 really well. We very quickly were invited to local schools and libraries and um, eventually partnered up with the, a church in, uh, in Montclair that had us perform for their, well, perform, hold the class for their um, part of their community at, with them on some Saturdays, it was like a fun Saturday event, come and see us and we would be part of that. Um, and that was where we would do our class. So it was going really, really well. We were in two separate schools as part of their curriculum. And then three sometime and then I think it eventually grew to four separate classes per week with um, close to full, full classes. Okay, great. Yeah. And then in the middle of the pandemic, you switched to, so obviously couldn't be in the classes mm -hmm. in person. So moved to an, an online kind of class or a course. Yes, model. There, were, there were, sorry, there were some really good aspects of the virtual that honestly, I hope that we can, we can figure out a way to keep promoting it because we were able to reach out to a diverse diverse crowd of professional musicians oh. that showcase their talents and explain their instrument because as Jenny said one of the one of the focuses of our class is that we bring in all these different instruments and show them and didn't want to just let that go so we reached out to incredibly talented professional musicians in in, in orchestras all over the world um, to showcase and send us film back of footage back that we would put into our virtual subscription. So we, we got some really good names, you know, and yeah. uh, that part was really, really exciting for us. And then we sat and filmed in, you know, Jenny's house and Brian did all of the editing himself. <laughs> uh, it was, I mean, we just wore the poor man out. Yeah. So we had, we, we ended up with a product that I think we're really, really, really proud of. Yeah. That we would love to get out there. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, and how was it received? So you put you put a lot of energy into filming everything, editing everything, and then you also put quite a bit of money behind marketing it and all of that mm -hmm. kind of stuff too, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I, and I do think it was received well. And I think the other the other really nice thing about the virtual subscription is that we were able to, you know, show people across the country some of whom, you know, we know or who have kids, um, what we do, whereas mm -hmm. here it's just these lucky kids in New Jersey that get to witness it. <laughs> but um, mostly. yeah, so other other people across the country were able to see what it was all about. And I think we uh, we also did some Facebook live events that that were worked better during the when the pandemic was really quite um quite heavily spreading and people really yeah. weren't going anywhere. Um, but I think ultimately, you know, parents don't want to necessarily set their kids in front of a screen and our class, the whole, you know, one of the main tent poles of what we're trying to do is to really um, show these kids what it's like to hold and play an instrument. I mean, that's one of the big, the big things. And okay. so, um, you know, as, as, as Emily said, though, seeing these instruments played by world renowned professionals is, is pretty great too. Yeah. Yeah. And is it true? So I guess, you know, one of the things that you're kind of grappling with is does, does this virtual component have, have a life, uh, you know, after the pandemic and, is it, or I guess, is that correct? You're trying to figure out kind of how to 
balance all of this? Absolutely. Uh, okay. I think part of it is there's a limit to what the three of us can do on a day to on a day to day schedule. And mm-hmm. so and obviously there's a limit to how many people we can reach in this immediate area. Yeah. So, yeah. And are you so are you maxed out at this point in terms of so I guess we didn't talk about I mean, were you able so pre pandemic, you were in two to three schools or libraries, were you able to, to go back into those now? We're in one now. Okay. Okay. Um, and I guess so eventually it, well okay so with two to three are you maxed out is that as much as you can do the three of you yes i think we'll be this fall we would we'll be coming back to our um public classes with not in the school but just in a public setting we'll be coming back to two one or two classes per week and that's and then with the school in the fall that's probably going to be it okay and, Speaking of the pandemic, uh, two of our founders pivoted in their personal lives and personal occupations as well. So okay. that that definitely created another challenge. It, it It's wonderful what they are able to do now, but it throws a wrench into our scheduling as a business. Oh, sure. Um, does it throw a wrench? Like you don't know, is their schedule kind of sporadic? Well, the, so the one of my personal problem is that since the pandemic, I have now be, been um, I've become a preschool teacher. And okay. so I'm now in the preschools at my school five days a week in the mornings, which is the the our school, the school that Meister Tales is in is the only time they can only do mornings and I'm only available in the afternoons now. Um, oh, got it. So I have not been able to be a part of that. Meister Tales class in the school setting because I was at my school the whole year. And what age range is Meister Tales for? We should say for zero to five babies, zero infants. To five. Five. Mm-hmm. Okay, because you do it in your preschool. I did a version of it for the for the end of the year camp, but it was okay. just me, and it was not. I was not Maestro. I just. <laughs> Did kind of a, a, a not even a story. It was a really pared pared down version. I just really took elements of it, but they did say that they would be interested in having us next year for the okay. camp. Show. That's cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's really fun. Um, that's great. Okay, so the availability is an issue, and because of the age range, like are most kids back at home in the afternoons? Is that why that's not really a great option for the schools? I know for for the one particular preschool that we're in, the majority of their students are only there in the mornings. Okay, and they because they want all of their students to uh, to participate in this class, they always want it scheduled in the morning since most of their or a number of their students leave in the afternoon. Okay. That makes sense. And I guess I'm kind of getting in the weeds of the details here. I think ultimately the issue is that you want to grow your business. There's only three of you. You have other lives and other things going on. And so how how do you grow? Um, and because one of the things that you had kind of on, you know, on the list of of goals for the for the business um, in the long run was to franchise as well. So there's, you know, there is a need to figure out how to grow kind of outs that isn't reliant on, on the three of you and your time solely. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. So are there schools, I, I guess, are there, are there schools that you're not able that want you, but you're not able to show up for them right now? I would say that's probably the case. If, if we were to if we were to really start asking around, we would probably be desired and not able to fulfill that commitment. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's a great problem to have. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So if that's the case and, and the idea is to keep going with this, cause it's a great idea, right? I think with, and we were talking about this a bit before that with businesses that, that, you know, where we are the founders, 
we have an amazing idea and that idea is oftentimes dependent to start at least on us and the information that we have or the skill set that we have or the vision that we have. And it's hard to get from that place of being the person that's, that is doing it all, having the idea, executing the idea and everything in between. So is there... Is your pricing and all of that kind of stuff set up to support bringing on other people outside of you? Um, so other performers that um, that you could pay and pay, you know, a, an amount that you feel good about and they feel good about um, and start to deliver these these classes instead of instead of the three of you. Well, that's a great question, Angie. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in the past, we have had um, other we've had a few other people come on to do Brian's role as Maestro with a puppet. And while it definitely um, was able to fill the gap when Brian had to step away for a few months, um, there was the added complication. And maybe this is the that control thing that's going on that the founders that we feel that it, when somebody steps in to be Maestro, um, that doesn't land as well as when Mr. Brian himself is doing it. And we are trying to to figure out a way that we can have other people, whether it's bringing, it's kind of like, you know, when, um, um, if somebody else were to put, put on Elmo the, the yeah. and try to be Elmo, the kids would yeah. just be like, this is not Elmo. Yeah. And we were, getting, you know, we didn't get that feedback from the kids specifically, but it, we, we felt it as performers. Yeah. We felt that this was just nah, not up to our, our standards as the, as the performers. So um, I think in, in, as far as franchising this out, we have spoken, um, there is easily, you know, band, band teachers and band directors around the nation could easily take care of the instrument showcase stuff. We could easily um, record and have a, have the recording set for the instrumental, the piano stuff that Jenny and I do during the class, and it, you know, we could make a special puppet that is not that is Maestro, but that doesn't from the beginning of the class have other people stepping in to take that over. If that makes sense, it's the mm -hmm. same person doing Maestro from the beginning. Yeah, yeah. In this specific setting. Um, we're we're working on how that how we could get different puppets for how puppeteers with different puppets to do that role yeah. okay it okay. does it sometimes it feels like we've painted ourselves into a corner a little bit mm -hmm. but i don't think I, I i think that's like emily was saying the uh, uh, more of a control element and this this old uh feeling of if you want something done right just do it yourself that we yeah. have taken on and per perhaps don't need to but we do think that I mean, the puppet is a very important piece, not just as our mascot, but as a as a, um, a a way that that kids are. I mean, it's the whole reason Sesame Street does so well. It's a way to connect to the kids. Mm -hmm. um, and so the puppet is so extremely important. And I completely understand this idea that Elmo is not the same. Yeah. If any, if just anybody puts, puts this Elmo puppet on. So, yeah, yeah I wonder, um, I mean, you, your performers and, you know, are in New York and I'm sure have a lot of friends on Broadway and things like that. Have you ever, or maybe you have been, I don't know, but have you ever, um, you know, they kind of have this same issue or could potentially have the same issue, right? The same person can't, well, they've got the touring group and then they've got the the group that's performing on Broadway. And obviously the same people, the same cast can't be in both places. And even, you know, the same person, if it's a Broadway show and they're performing seven days a week, the same person can't be, you know, in every single one of those seven shows. So they have to have understudies. They have to, or they, not even understudies, right? They have two or three people that play those main, those main roles. Um, mm -hmm. and they just swap out depending on the day. Now, if you're a big Broadway person, you're going when the person that you want to see is, you know, is performing, but you know, there's still, 
getting rave reviews and, you know, people are still eating up what they're, you know, what, what they're putting out into the world. Have you talked to anybody in that field to see how they, uh, how they ensure some continuity, ensure that each of those people are, um, are kind of embracing the same, um, the same performance quality and, and things like that. It's a really good point. And, and actually Brian, our, our other founder is a standby on Broadway. So oh, wow. Okay. He does this. He steps in and takes, takes, takes over and probably, you know, understands that what, what that role is and the, the feeling of being the person to have to step in and fill some shoes that maybe a lot of people in the audience were, were expecting, mm -hmm. you know? Um, yeah. And actually the two that we had who filled Brian's shoes while he was gone were both Broadway performers who, oh, wow. who understand that notion as well. And I don't think we could have gotten two better people to, to fill those shoes. So, yeah. and it, it, you know, we kind of say that we limped by until Brian was back. And I think that, I think that that's probably that's probably not giving them as much credit as they deserve. Sure. You know? Yeah. And I know that there's a, there's a big uh, movement on Broadway right now, honoring uh, standbys and understudies because so many of them were able to step up and show what they can do during the pandemic. And they still are. Mm -hmm. And so <laughs> it feels a little bit wrong for us to sit here and say that nobody can fill those shoes. And I think that is the piece that we are really trying to actively, um, oh. you know, trying to solve and trying to step away from that notion of, of nobody can do it like we can. Cause it's, yeah. it's not true. And that's a really good point. Yeah, it's, it is really hard. I mean, I think I, you know, I had said this earlier that we all struggle. I think I shouldn't say all, but most entrepreneurs struggle with the same thing because you are building it from the ground up. You're heavily invested in it. And, you know, there's, there is a lot there that is you and it's hard to pass that on. And I wonder if there's an element of, um, of, of creating and so the the way that it's been implemented before is that they they have been stand-ins, right? They've been substitutes for something else. And so I wonder if there's an element of just creating kind of an autonomous um <gasps> role where like you're giving them ownership of this. You're finding the classes for them to teach in. You're finding, you know, you're developing the curriculum and they're following that, but it's really their class. And, you know, you can put some, some checks and balances in there where, you know, maybe you're in the class, like maybe one of the days, one of the days of curriculum involves a special guest, which is you so that, you know, one of you, not all three of you, but one of mm -hmm. you, um, so that you can make sure that they, you know, that they are living and breathing the values that are important to, to you you and and they're getting the results that that are important to you from the participants it's a, it's, a sound... it's a great idea and it sounds dreamy it sounds like <laughs> the dream like you create this thing and then you want to sort of um it's like you write an ebook and then you want to sit back and just kind of <laughs> get the information out there and reap the benefit you know the financial benefits totally. but um uh yeah I, 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 when you said, you know, a sort of, it, it just got me thinking, mm -hmm. right, giving someone else ownership and having maybe a, like a generic non Maestro puppet that could be put on by anybody and could mm -hmm. be named anything that anybody could do rather than, you know, these specific corners that we painted ourselves into. Yeah. Yeah. And that might be, I mean, you know, a Broadway show, I, I'm just going to keep, I guess, going back to that as an example, but a Broadway show, I'm sure there's, you know, there are elements of like the vision is this in an ideal world. This is what I would love every, this song to be and this dance to be and this monologue to be right. Like, and, and then I'm sure that there are adjustments that are made because okay, we're humans, not everybody, you know, if, if it's so important that it be said in this way, at, or in this exact 
or that it occurs in this exact way, um, the the likelihood of that of that hitting is not is not going to be good, right? Because and if you want it to live on, you know, past the the one year or the one opening night or you know whatever it is, um, so you know that's not that's not saying that. You, and I think we had this conversation earlier too, that that's not saying that you have to compromise the quality, but I think that as, as business owners, there is, um, there's this dance, this balance that has to occur between the outcome that you're providing and the sustainability of, of what you're providing. Because if, you know, if people can get the same results or get similar results, um, being in a class that is slightly different but sustainable, then that's then that's a dreamland, right? Because they're not. If you guys can't last, like if you can't keep doing this, if you're burning yourselves out, then there's no. They're not getting any benefit from that eventually, right? Exactly. So I think there's that that fine balance of um, you know. And again, I'm not saying that you have to compromise the quality, but you know, just balancing kind of all of the all of the things that matter in this and and you matter and the students matter. And so how do you, how do you bridge that in a way that, that works for both of you? Yeah, yeah. those are really good points. I, um, I, I, when we dream big, we, we really see being able to send out little starter packages almost to yeah. you know, schools elementary schools, even, um, around the, around the nation of how to do this class, because it, yeah. there is no reason why, like I said, band teachers and, and elementary school music teachers around the, the nation and around the world can't do what we do. Yeah. 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 And I wonder if the online component becomes m something more geared towards that than, mm -hmm. Having, because I think you're right, I, especially after, you know, living inside for two years straight, I think parents are really hesitant to like continue that trend. You know, they yeah. want to get out and be playing and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and so, yeah, I, I can definitely see how that could be a challenge to, to get their buy-in on, and, you know, even though it's way more fun than just watching a cartoon, but um, I, I wonder if the online piece is geared more towards sharing this, getting this in more people, more teachers hands or people that are able to teach the, what you're doing. And, and that can still be a business, right? I mean, you can still charge for that, that, that can be maybe the start of a franchise model to a certain extent, right? Where you're, you're kind of dipping your toe in, um, in releasing the reins, in training people in, you know, really, um, encapsulating the, the message and the, the mission. Um, so I, you know, not to, not to have it be more work, but you know, there's, there's probably ways that you could repurpose what you've already done. Or, I mean, you're in a classroom right now, you could literally just put a video camera at the back. It doesn't, and, and it doesn't even have to be high quality. Like it could be your phone, yeah. you know, on a resting against a book and just recording one, one of your classes or even the entire semester and then pulling things, pulling things out of that to, to be able to communicate what the, what your vision is and what you want people to be doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And with your your analogy with the Broadway world, I mean, this is the, the best directors are the ones who who trust their entire company and let, and kind of let them go. So, yeah. Yeah. And I think so. I was really excited for this conversation because it touches on all of the things that like fire me up in, you know, in working with people. And one of those things is that. So, yes. And I also want to say that I think what scares what what scares me and what I what I hear scares a lot of other entrepreneurs in in you know hiring a team in working with other people in letting go of the reins is that it does it does kind of feel like it's um, black and white like you either completely let go of control and and just like let them be them or you you've got it so locked down that it, you know nobody can nobody can penetrate yeah and, and um and i think that there's a happy medium because the you know i believe that 
I don't know. I don't know a ton about Broadway, but I, you know, those directors are very intentional in the way that they're communicating. They're very intentional about what they're trying to accomplish and they instill that in. So it's not like they just hire, hire an actor, give them the script and then, you know, and that's it, right? Like they're right. working with them all the way along, you know, along the way to, to really communicate and make sure that they understand what they, they understand the job, right? Like they understand what they're there to do. Um, and so I think, you know, as, as the leaders of, of your company and the, the visionaries, if, if there's a way that you can get really clear, you know, kind of, um, if you could clone yourself, what are all of the values that that you would want to make sure that that clone had? What are um, what are all of the things that you want them to be thinking of? What are all of the you know how do you want them to show up in in the room? All of those types of things. If you could get clear on those, and I know that as creatives, this is gonna just like feel yucky. But if you could document <laughs> it in some way, and and that documentation could be a video, it could be writing it down, it could be I, a collage, like whatever whatever can can transfer that information to somebody else is and and be able to do it over and over again is really i think the thing that is going to give you the most enjoyment in what you're doing because that means at some point you get to step away and you start you get to start creating new things like mm -hmm. you get to start creating these packages these beautiful exciting packages to send around you get to start thinking uh, more, you know, about more and more things that you can, that you can be doing, but also the people, you know, the team that that's there to support you can be doing as well. That's really good advice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> does it feel doable <laughs> though? Um, it does. It does. It does. I, I, I think the, I think the, um, re repurposing the online, um, the the virtual class that we did is such a great idea and i think setting up a camera and just recording it i mean it's like emily said there's no reason there's just no reason why people can't can't do this um and it, i i it it will just take a little bit of you know heads down work for us to to put together this kind of package and exact and be able to relay all of the important elements of what this class is and then, and then sort of trust it and let it go. Yeah. Yeah. And if it's something, you know, again, I, um, I guess I just, yeah, it doesn't have to be perfect. It can be really, I mean, you'll want it to be perfect in terms of making sure that you're saying all of the things and conveying everything that you want. But in terms of the way that it looks and the way that it's edited together and all of that kind of stuff, it doesn't, it really doesn't have to be perfect. And, you know, I guess the, the least amount of time I, I'm kind of, not wanting to say that out loud, but the least amount of time that you can spend on it and still get the same, you know, and still be able to to convey the same message and the same information is probably just the, the best way to do it. And then, you know, in terms of spreading it out into the world, I mean, as a preschool teacher, you've got to have so many connections and with young kids, like there's just even, you know, probably within a 20 minute radius of where you are, there's so many opportunities yeah. and, and, you know, it sounds like people would be welcoming it with open arms. Yeah. Oh, it's fun to teach. I will say, yeah. I mean, I know, I know Emily said earlier during when she had to pivot and has this new job that conflicts with the class, she has missed teaching this whole year. It is, it's fun to do. And, uh, I do think that by watching one or two or three classes, anyone who is a musician in any capacity would go, I, I see what you're trying to do, you know? Yeah. 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 Okay. I, I, can I ask, and just, I, well, I just want to go back to a question. Is the, is everything set up from a, a pricing standpoint to be able to support having people other than you teaching the classes? I don't think immediately. Okay. 
I think this is going to have to be a long, I think it will, I'm trying, I'm kind of processing through like a five-year plan of getting to be able to start franchising. We um, probably have a year or so of, of just keeping our heads down around our local area and getting the classes back up and running that we know we can fill. Mm -hmm. Um, And maybe within a couple of years of, of, paying down some of the small business loan that we had to acquire over the yeah. pandemic mm-hmm. um, and and getting ourselves back on some stable financial footing, we will be able to start branching out and doing this like in a, in like a, I don't know, three to five year time frame. Yeah. Is it worth uh, maybe just trying it on a smaller scale in terms of like one of the classes that you already have lined up subbing in somebody permanently um that's not one of the three of you into that to just start to i mean maybe in a couple of them (laughs) (laughs) like i do want to honor the fact that that so i think in as entrepreneurs we have a lot of different voices to find, right? We have our the voice that we want to share with our potential clients or, you know, the people that we're working with and serving. And then we also have to have, uh, we have to find our voice as a leader and, you know, somebody that is going to have a team. And so, and both of those take, I mean, take a surprising amount of time to find. And so, If you just, so I guess what I'm saying is it seems like maybe there's a couple of different stages and maybe you're in one of the, those stages right now. And so franchising, yeah, I think that's, that seems down the road, Mm -hmm. Um, but it feels like there's an opportunity to expand and grow even right now, but you just can't expand and grow just with the three of you. Um, and so I wonder if that expansion can happen just by like, you know, adding one or two people to the mix and seeing and seeing how that goes. And and, you know, that might mean that it doesn't go great one of those times, but at least you find you find a way to make it work. Yeah. Yeah. That's good advice. And it's it's something that um, that I do think we should we, we, we actually need to start doing, Yeah, you know, we're there. We need to start doing that because the, the next thing that we're trying is just Emily and me, but that will also, there's a limit to how much we can do too. Totally. So, totally. Yeah. Yeah. And if you, and if it's just the, you know, the, I know that you're probably on all the time in the classroom, but you know, you're probably on uh, even more when it's just two of you versus three of you. Yeah. Um, so that's going to be, a little bit more draining. And I guess from a pricing standpoint or, you know, from a a revenue standpoint, one thing to keep in mind too, is that the, um, you know, if, if you're not doing the work necessarily, then you could, the, the one class that you're in, I know that I'm just using that as an example. I know you're in more, but what the one class that you're in could become two classes. And so even though you personally are not making as much on the individual class, you, because you'd be able to double the classes that you're in, you'd be making more revenue, even though you're paying uh, more profit, more revenue and more profit. um, Even though you, you'd be paying somebody else to be in the classroom instead of you. Yeah. So that might be a way to consider it. So if you've got, you know, five, five schools that, you know, right now want you like maybe, maybe say yes, absolutely to those five schools, but the two of you are only doing two or three of those. And yeah. then somebody else is doing, you know, the, the other two. Okay. All right. I know that we didn't talk. So one of the things that you wanted to talk about was marketing. And I, um, I feel like this is going to be controversial (laughs) that I'm saying this (laughs) one, I'm not a marketing person, but I also feel like we, uh, entrepreneurs have a, a tendency to overthink marketing in terms of that. I mean, it sounds like you don't need to be marketing really right now. Um, you've got people that you aren't able to serve 
that, yeah. that want your services. And so it really seems like right now you've done all the marketing that you, I mean, I know that, you know, you want to keep your brand alive. You want to keep being visible and all of those types of things. But if, you know, if you've got people, it, it seems like right now it makes sense to just figure out how you can, how you can serve all of the people that want, want what you're offering. Um, and then, and then, you know, that will also increase your revenue, which then you'll be able to, you know, put more money and more resources towards more of a, um, a more traditional, I guess, marketing approach. Yeah. Does that seem, um, I think yeah. that, I mean, I think that's a fair point because we, we did, we put a lot of money into marketing and I'm not, they're wonderful. And yeah. they're good people and they're really good at what they do, but it didn't do a whole heck of a lot mm -hmm. as far as what we were hoping would happen. And I think that, um, I think one of my fears is we, sh you know, sh start doing some marketing as in like pop-up events or, you know, trying to appear at the library or this or that, and that we get asked to do more than we can handle. That's what right. I really, right. I mean, the virtual subscription is a different story that, that, mm -hmm. you know, that's a, that's a different story. And the, that's kind of what we were trying to connect the marketing to. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think our class necessarily, I think you're right. I don't think it needs like the social media presence that we think it does. Yeah, because that stuff can be a real time sucker. And if you're not, you know, and again, I'm not saying don't do any of it because it is important that, you know, you you want your marketing to be kind of out, you know, out in front of you, not behind you. Yeah. And so, um, you know, there is an element of it that I that I do think is important. But it sounds like right now, like you've been you've been doing what you need to do. And I think, you know, when at least I suffered from this when I started my business. I thought I had to be doing all of these things. I had to be posting. I had to be advertising. I had to be, you know, blah, 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 blah. And I really didn't even have, this is not the case for you, but I didn't even really have a product that I was asking people to buy. I mean, I knew what I wanted to do, but I didn't have a way to talk about it. I didn't have, you know, I had, I had me to deliver it, but I, so, you know, I was doing all of these things and, I'm like, well, I really actually should have been spending time figuring out like what, what, what am I selling? What, how do I talk about it? How do I put it together? What do people want? Um, and so I, you know, I think it's the, the marketing is obviously very important and it, there's a lot of other elements that you want in place to make sure that the, the marketing is, um, is going to give you a good return on the investment in time and, and money too. Yeah. yeah. And grassroots, I am just becoming more and more of a fan of grassroots marketing. It is yeah. just like, talk to the people, you know, Yeah, <laughs> like, that yeah. Is surprising. Well, that's how it's, I mean, that's how it's the, been. you know, the class, the class sort of speaks for it, speaks for itself too. It feels yeah. like, it feels like when we post, it's like, that doesn't quite encapsulate <laughs> what, right. what's going, what's actually going on in the class and the benefits that come from it. Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, you might, again, not a marketer, but you might even benefit from just having other people market for you. So the parents in the classroom that are coming up to you afterwards, like that was amazing that like, why not have them, you know, ask them to post something on their yeah. social media or something, yeah. right? Instead of, yeah. instead of you guys having to grind it out and figure out how to, how to make all of that magic come alive on, you know, in one post. I mean, it speaks wonders for other people to do that for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, ladies, anything else we, you want to talk about or, um, or any, I guess, pieces that feel missing from what we've already talked about? I don't know. I don't know. So. We really, we really had on the, the concerns that, uh, and the, the space that we're in right now. I, I think we, we covered a lot. Yeah. Yeah. It feels, I mean, does it feel, yeah. Does it feel clear? Like, uh, do you, yeah. Do you have some clear takeaways from it? 
Yes, I do. I do. Yeah. I do. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, yeah. The letting go and the getting other people on board just to show us that we that they that anybody can do this. I think we all need to see that for ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing all of this. Thank you for sharing your work. Um, I am going to put your website up on the screen. Oh, no, I'm cutting Jenny's off. Um, (laughs) So people do you want to tell people how they can find you and potentially work with you? Yes, so we uh, will be back in person live classes in Montclair, New Jersey this fall, and we will start our signups for that pretty soon. And um, if anybody is interested, there are there, I believe our video subscription, there is a virtual subscription that is available for purchase right now through our website. And we also, is it true that we still have a, a free episode on YouTube somewhere just to to try. I think so too. I think so. And it's all, it's all on the, everything is on the website. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you ladies so much. This was awesome. I, I'm, I'm excited to see where this goes and like super excited to see you maybe take some, um, maybe take some breaths and some space that you haven't felt like you've been able to take for a while. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having us. Absolutely. Thank you. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe so you're notified when a new episode is posted. Rate and review this podcast and share it with all of your friends. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you're leaving with some great things that can help you move from hustle to flow, because I believe in you and your business. Until next time.